Nos eitha chreisio cyfeillion, mae'n braf gweld chi gyd yma heno. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the second professionally speaking event organised by the Education Workforce Council. I hope you'll enjoy this evening's discussion. Um, I do believe this is the first time that our four commissioners have been on stage together. <laughs> and uh, I hope that they're looking forward to sharing their thinking with us and responding to your questions. Our rapporteurs for the night, Captain Half Jones, will no doubt expertly navigate us through that. We're very grateful for the support and sponsorship of our colleagues at the Open University, which has been instrumental in making this evening possible, and we look forward to this continued collaboration in the future. We're grateful to have had the support tonight from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and her colleague Assembly members, leading policymakers and practitioners from all our registrant groups. And on a personal note, can I say it's great to have a Cabinet Secretary for Education that gets it? <laughs> And uh, you don't shy away from the challenges of leading education in Wales, but you manage to do so whilst demonstrating your support for educational professionals in Wales, and we value that. Your belief and enthusiasm for the work that's undertaken in our schools, colleges, universities and workplaces is particularly noticeable whenever you speak, but particularly highlighted on the stage yesterday at the inaugural Professional Teaching Awards, which is a wonderful new addition to the calendar that celebrates all that's good about our school settings. And I congratulate all at Welsh Government for its introduction. Now that registration has been extended to the wider education workforce in Wales, it's particularly pleasing to have strong representation here tonight from FE, work-based learning, learning support, and youth work, as well as um, school teaching. You're all warmly welcome. Collectively, we are the people who can align our efforts to ensure the success of the education system in Wales for the benefit of all those learners in our care and ultimately society at large. And I'm sure we'll hear some really good ideas from our commissioners tonight on how we can best do that. We're at a crucial time in the reform process of education in Wales. And I'd also encourage you to emulate the approach taken by the Cabinet Secretary at last year's event and take tonight's opportunity to network and discuss issues with colleagues from all sectors. Our commissioners are joined by top Welsh broadcaster and journalist Catherine Harve Jones, and having interviewed several leading politicians such as uh, UK wide household names David Cameron, Nick Clegg, Ed Miliband, and Nigel Farage, as well as Wales First Minister Catherine Jones and other Welsh party leaders. I'm sure that Catherine will remain firmly in charge of tonight's proceedings, and we're delighted to welcome her back. Rice and all, Catherine. And so to this evening's speakers, I'm sure that they won't need much introduction due to the high profile nature of their work. But I thought it would be worth just spending a minute or two looking back on what their hopes and aspirations for their roles were when they were appointed, just as a way of context for this evening. Dywedodd Mary Hughes, Commission of the Gymraeg, oedd baratoi fynd i'r afal ar dasg fawr sydd o'r ymlaen, rhwng weledigaeth yw Cymru lle mae'r Gymraeg yn gwbl gynolog mewn bywyd cyhoeddus. Lle mae gan siaradwyr Cymraeg hyder i ddefnyddio'r iaith. Rwy'n gwerthfarogi'r cyfle i nigrw hwn i fynd ar Gymraeg ymlaen, i gyfnod newydd ac yn edrych ymlaen yn fawr iawn at agor pennod gyffroes arall yn ein hanes. A dyma eiriau Sophie Howe, Comisiynydd Gynedlaethau Dyfodol. Fy'n waith i yw bod yn warchodwr cenedlaethau'r dyfodol. Mae hynny'n golygu help i cyrff cyhoeddus a rhai sy'n gwneud polisi yn Nghymru i feddwl am effaith hir dymor i penderfyniadau. Mae gennym i gyd ran i'w chwarae wrth adeiladu'r Gymru yr ydym am ei gweld yn y dyfodol. Rwyf eisiau gwrando, dysgu a'n herion i gyd i gyflawn i hynny. Yn ôl i Sally Holland, Comisiynydd Plant, dwi'n falch o Hanes Cymru o ran hybu hawliau plant a phobl ifanc, ac mi weithio fy'n galed i sicrhau bod hyn yn parhau ac yn cryfhau. Mae plant 
a phobl ifanc yn gwnebu cyfleoedd a cheriau newydd mewn cymdeithas cyfleus. Mi weithiaf gyda phlant a phobl ifanc Cymru i wneud yn siŵr bod eu hawliau yn cael eu hamddiffyn a'u hyrwyddo. Ac yn olaf, dyma obeithion Sara Rokira, Comisiynydd Pobl Hun. Mae Cymru wedi arwain y ffordd trwy sefydlu Comisiwn Pobl Hun cyntaf y byd, gan adlewyrchu ymrwymiad i wella bywydau Pobl Hun. Mae Pobl Hun yn un o hasedau gorau ni, ac edrychaf ymlaen at weithio gyda hwy ac ar eu rhan yn ystod y pedan blynydd nesaf, gan chwarae fy rhan mewn gwneud yn siŵr ein bod yn yma yng Nghymru, nid yn unig yn gwarchod ac yn cefnogi rhai sydd fwyaf agored i niwed, ond ein bod ni hefyd yn gwneud Cymru yn lle gwych i dyfu'n hun ynddo i bawb. Commissioners, we're delighted to welcome you this evening and we look forward with interest to hearing what you have to say. I'll leave you now in the capable hands <coughs> of Catherine Dielchavau. Diolch Angela am y cyflwyniad ar croeso cynnes yma ac a'i estyn yn croeso cynnes i chi gyd. Yng Ngorchwyl Bleserus i hynno yw cydeirio'r dyfodaeth yma, siarad yn broffesiynol 2017, gyda'r cwestiwn gogleisiol iawn newid addysg, newid Cymru. It's my pleasure tonight to chair this discussion, professionally speaking, 2017, asking whether changing education can change Wales. Um, this is, of course, a bilingual event, and you do all have translation equipment, which uh, I'm sure you've uh, gradually familiarised yourselves with during the introduction. Um, a note from our translator, kind translator here this evening, um, use these as, as we will be conversing and taking comments and questions later in Welsh, and can you please leave them behind once the evening has ended? Apparently, a few have disappeared during, uh, during previous events. Y bwriad heno yw dechrau gyda chyflwyniad yr un gan ein siaradwyr gwaf, cyn symud mlaen wedyn i drafod cwestiynau o'r llawr wrth o chi. Felly, newid addysg, newid Cymru. Pwy sy'n mynd i fentro mynd ar afael a chwestiwn mor ddyrrys? Yn ffordus iawn, mae dyna ni byder o gomisiynwyr Cymru gyda ni heno yn barod i drafod a rhoi safbwynt nhw ar bethau ni. Ni wedi cael cyflwyniad da i fi'n o eisoes gan Angela Hwara Teichi, a na'i gyflwyniad nhw'n sydyn yn y drefn fyddan nhw'n wneud i cyflwyniadau heno. Yn gyntaf, Comisiynydd y Gymraeg, Mary Hughes, Mary yw deiliad cyntaf a swydd hon wedi ffenodi adeg creu'r rôl nôl yn o'i filadeiddeg. Wedyn fyddwn i'n clywed gan Gomisiynydd Plant Cymru, Sally Holland. Dechreuodd Sally Holland ar ei swydd yn 2015 a hi yw'r trydydd person i ymgymryd ar rôl ers i sefydlu yn 2001. Our third speaker this evening will be Sarah Rokira, Wales' older People, People's Commissioner. Sarah started in the role in 2012, following a career that has given a vast experience of working with older people. And finally this evening, we'll hear from our newest Commissioner this evening, the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, Sophie Howe. Sophie started in a new role last year and is indeed the first person to do the job. Felly, croeso cynnes eich gyd ac edrych ymlaen clywed eich cyflwyniadau chi heno. A dyna ni, felly, heb ddweud rhagor, gai gyflwyno yn siaradwraig wadd gyntaf ni heno, sef Comisiynydd y Gymraeg, Mary Hughes. Nos wedda, diolch am y gwahoddiad, diolch am y croeso, a diolch am y cyflwyniad. Fel i chi'n gweld, dwi wedi newid y teitl, dwi wedi colli'r mar cwestiwn. Sut dim cwestiwn? yn y mar ni, o gymryd addysg fel arf fy newch i newid y byd. O gymryd addysg fel y ffordd ymlaen fy allwn ni greu Cymru sydd yn bwrpasol, yn ffit i bwrpas ac yn Gymru un un falch o fod yn rhan o hwnna fe. Yn y jyst Nelson Mandela ddiwedodd hynny. Os ydych chwni ar ddatganiad Llywodraeth Cymru nôl yn 2003, pan gyflwynwyd iaith pawb, cydnabyddiaeth fod addysg yn gynolog i'r hyn yn ni'n ceisio greu yma yng Nghymru, sef Cymru ddwyaethog, sef yn gweithredu yn naturiol, normal ddwyaethog o ddydd i ddydd. Dyna oedd yn gweled i geddi ar y dachrau, ac heb addysg allwn i ddim gwireddu 
y weledigaeth yna. Dyna'r her, dyna'r cyfle, dyna'r sialenj, ond wir, ond diw hwnna yn ddyletswydd gwych i gael. O edrych ar Gymru heddi, nid Cymru 2003, ond Cymru 2017, beth yw'r heriau a'r cyfleoedd o ran addysg? Gwel, mi allwn ni sefyll fy nena mawr, Lea, a'r chanu yng Ngweledigaeth i. Ond gen ni gymryd yn gynta Target Llywodraeth, miliwn y siaradwyr erbyn ganol y ganrif, dyna'r miliwn erbyn 2015. Uchel geisiol, anhygol uchel geisiol, ond gwych o uchel gais. Dyna'r nod, a mi'n rhaid i ni sicrhau bod ni'n cyrraedd y nod, a gofewn y daith yna sy'n cwestiwn fod addysg yn rhan mawr o'r ateb. O ddydd i ddydd, dwi'n cwrdda cyflogwyr, penaethiad sefydliadau, rhai ohonyn nhw yn y stafell yma. Yn ddyddiol, dwi'n clywed pobl sydd yn ymaes iechyd, gofal, gweinyddiaeth cyhoeddus, addysg, twristiaeth, hamdden, busnes, gwaith i enctyd yn dweud wrth â i, mae angen gweithwyr dweithog arna i. Os ydw i mynd i wireddu yr hyn, dwi'n geisio wneud o ran yn sefydliad, o ran y cyfrifoldebau sydd arna i, fel pennaeth sefydliad, mae'r rhaid i fi gael gweithwyr dweithog. Heb system addysg sydd yn creu y siaradwyr yna, a'r gweithwyr yna, newn ni ddim gwireddu'r weledigaeth yna. Dwi wedi sôn am benaethiad sefydliadau, dwi wedi sôn am dargedau llywodraeth, ma'n y beryg ar y degau i'n hofio y profiad i'r dysgwr, a gael osod y trydydd her i ni. Yma yng Nghymru, gwlad fach sydd yn honni ar y degau fod yn glyfar, ma'n rhaid i ni wella profiad addysg pobl i fenc yn arbennig rhyna sydd falle yn cyfarfod y Gymraeg am y tro cyntaf. Mae'r rhaid i ni gael y profiad yna yn brofiad gwerth chweil, er mwyn sicrhau bod y bobl i fenc yna yn parhau i fod yn siaradwyr Cymraeg y dyfodol ac yn weithwyr Cymraeg y dyfodol. Be sy'n creu siaradwyr Cymraeg? Yn y ffigurau tu ôl i fi, Fy welwch chi ar yr ochr pen pella, 65, oedran 65 a throsodd yng Nghymru, jyst y bod yng Nghymredleth i. Ble ddysgon nhw'r Gymraeg yn y cartre? Pedwar o bob perso, pimp o fobl yng Nghymru dros 65 sy'n siarad Cymraeg wedi dysgu'r Gymraeg ar yr aelwyd yn y gymuned, yn y capel, gytre. Edrychwch ar ochr arall y picture yna, y rhai rhent tair a phymtheg mlwyddod yma yng Nghymru heddi. Mae'r ffigurau wedi troi ar eu pen. Pedwar o bob pimp plentyn yng Nghymru heddi, sy'n siarad Cymraeg, wedi dysgu'r iaith yn yr ysgol. Mae'r picture wedi newid yn llwyr. A mae'n rhaid ni gydnabod hynny, a mae'n rhaid ni weithio gyda reality heriol hynny, ond mae ddyliwch am y potensiol sydd wrth eich bod chi o fewn y gyfundraf na ddysg yn creu y siaradwyr newydd yna. Dyna mae gwrfa gweithwyr y dyfodol. Cofiwch hynny a byddwch yn falch o hynny. A mae'r system addysg wedi creu siaradwyr ar hyd y blynyddoedd. Os ydych chi'n ei ar y graff yma, graff sy'n dangos um, niferoedd y cyfrifiad. Os ydrychwch chi ar y niferoedd anhygol yna, y lwmp camel reit ar y dechrau, dylanwad y system addysg ar yn pobl i fenc ni. Mae'r system addysg yn creu siaradwyr. Dos na ddim cwestiwn am hynny, a mae'r rhaid ni ddathlu hynny, a mae'r rhaid ni gydnabod hynny, a mae'r rhaid ni fynd yn cam pellach. Ar her, un o'r heriau dwi'n rhoi, un hunan ac un i wrth bod ni'n trafod fy'n hyn. Mae creu siaradwr yn un peth. Mae creu siaradwr rhygl, hyderus. 
fydd yn gallu defnyddio'r Gymraeg yn y gweithle yn y dyfodol yn her chynegol. Mae rhai yn honni bod fi wedi dysgu Ffrangeg yn yr ysgol, nes i ddim, es i wersi Ffrangeg. Perig yw bod ni'n gwneud, gwneud yr un peth gyda'n pobl i fencni ar y gweitha, ar y gorau mae'n wych, ar y gweitha mae'r un profiad ag es i wrth peidio dysgu Ffrangeg. Mae rhaid i ni greu siaradwyr prigl. Drychwch eto'r y calofnau tu ôl i fi. 800 o bobl sydd wedi dysgu'r Gymraeg gytre yn dweud i bod nhw'r rhygl. Y ffigwr sydd o ddiddordeb mawr i fi yw bod yr ail golofn fyna, cant, hanner cant y cant, o bobl sydd wedi dysgu Cymraeg mewn addysg blynyddoedd cynnar, beth bynnag yw natur yr addysg yna yn timlo i bod nhw yn rhygl. Smydwch mlaen ffigurau'n disgyn y sylweddol wedyn pan i'ch yn edrych yn rhai hynny sydd wedi dysgu y Gymraeg yn yr ysgol gynradd ac yr ysgol uwchradd. Mae'r neges yn glir. Gorau pwy gynted i ni'n cyflwyno'r Gymraeg fel sgil defnyddiol i'n pobl i fencni. Un o'r cyfleoedd penna dwi'n credu yw addysg fynyddodd cynnar. Os yn i o ddifri am greu'r Gymru newydd yna, mae angen i ni gydio mewn addysg blynyddodd cynnar a chyflwyno'r Gymraeg i plant ni ar yr adeg yna. I ni'n wlad fach, i ni'n wlad glyfar, ddyle hwnna ddim fod yn ormod o her. O wneud hynny, mae yna fwy o gyfle i ni greu siaradwyr prigl hyderus sydd yn parhau i ddefnyddio'r Gymraeg wrth bod nhw'n symud mlaen mewn bywyd. Dyna rhan o'r ateb, edrychwn ni ar flynyddoedd cynnar a dweud dyna i'w yn ôd. Ges symud mlaen wedyn yn gloi at addysg ôl yn dig chwech. O dda, gydio yn y plentyn yna a'i meithrau nhw, a'i magu nhw fel Cymru bach ifanc. Mae'n rhaid ni'n sicrhau bod y llwybr yn glir wedyn wrth bod nhw'n mynd trwy'r ysgol ac yn symud i addysg ôl yn dig chwech. Dwi wedi disgrifio addysg bellach yng Nghymru yn y gorffennol fel Cinderella pan mae'n dod at addysg cyfrwng Cymraeg. Dyw hwnna ddim yn y gyddol, mae'n reality, a dwi'n gwybod bod yna gynrychiolwyr o'r system addysg bellach yn eistedd yn yr ystafell yma. Dwi'n yn wir yn meddwl, mae dyma i'r maes lle all ni fydd soddi a chreu'r dilyniant yna. Ar hyn o bryd, 2.5 percent ond bobl i fenc ni'n pobl ni sy'n stydio mewn colegau addysg bellach sy'n cael unrhyw fath o'n wneud ar Gymraeg fel rhan o'u cwrs nhw. Mi ddylen ni fod yn edrych i newid hynny. Mi ddylen ni fod yn buddsoddi a sicrhau bod y gweithwyr un hyn yn ffordd o fewn yn colegau addysg bellach ni yn cael y cyfle i gadw'r Gymraeg yn fyw fel sgil gwaith. Fel sgil y gallan nhw defnyddio yn y meysydd iechyd gofal busnes ac yn y blaen. Dwi wedi sôn am dechrau'r daith, dwi wedi sôn am y cyfnod ôl yn dig chwech. Dwi credu bod y cwriclwm newydd, be bynnag fydd y cwriclwm newydd, yn rhan bwysig o'r frechdan honno. Mae'n rhaid i ni gael cwriclwm sydd yn gwneud synwyr o'r dechrau i'r diwedd, sydd yn creu gweithlu i ni yng Nghymru fydd yn ffit i bwrpas i'r dyfodol ac yn weithlu y gall ni fod yn falch o hwnna fe. Ac yn ola, dwi wedi sôn am systemau addysg. Yn y bôn, dyma'r sleid ddylen ni fod wedi dechrau gyda. Beth yw systemau addysg heb bobl? Beth yw systemau addysg heb y thrawon? Dyna lle mae angen i ni fydsoddi ochr yn ochr a creu systemau gwahanol. Mae angen i'n edrych ar y ffordiant cychwynol y thrawon, mae'n rhaid i'n sicrhau bod yn ffit i bwrpas. Mae'n rhaid i'n edrych ar y ddysgu trwy gyfrwng dwy iaith fel sgil arbennig a fod yn falch o hwnna fe. A mae'n rhaid i'n sicrhau mae'n ei just addys cychwynol i'r thrawon i'n ei edrych arno, ond eich gyrfaoedd chi yn ei cyfandrwydd. Mae'n y fobl sydd yn ysu 
i fod yn cyfrannu at y daith yma, ond ddim yn teimlo bod y sgiliau gyda nhw. Dwi yn credu bod angen i ni fuddsoddi yn yn gweithlu addysg. Dwi yn teimlo'n gryf yn bod ni falle ar hyd y dygawdau dwetha yma wedi anghofio am bwysigrwydd yr y thrawon. So gadwyd ni ddechrau y daith trwy cydnabod pwysigrwydd y thrawon. Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi am rando, megis blas o'r sialyn sy'n blaenau ni. Semilan Commissioner Plant Cymru, Nessa, Sally Holland. Cymru chi'r meic yna. Just add our summer slides. Nos fai dda, bawb. Fyr ôl yw bod yn ben camp o'r hawliau plant anibynnol i holl blant a phobl i fan Cymru o'i geni hyd at fe naw. Ac mae geni ddylet soedd cyfreithiol i ddiogelu a hyroeddo hawliau plant. Dwi'n gwneud hyn ar lefelau gwahanol. Un, Dwi'n gweithio i sicrhau bod gennym ni'r polisiau a'r deffau cywar i hyroeddo hawliau plant. Dau, dwi'n monitro sut mae'r deffau a polisiau yn cael eu gweithredu ar draws Cymru. A tri, ar peth pwysicaf, dwi'n gwrando ar brofiadau plant ac yn monitro sut mae'r deffau a'r polisiau yn effeithio ar eu bywydau bob dydd. Pan dwi'n sôn am hawliau o'r plant, dwi'n golygu i'r 42 hawl sy'n rhan o confensiwn a cynhedloedd ddynedig ar hawliau o'r plentyn. Wrth cwrs, mae hynny yn cynnwys o'r hawl i ddweud i dweud, i ofal iechyd, addysg, bwyd alleti o'r hawl i chwarae ac ymlacio. Yr hawl i fod yn ddiogel, a'r hawl i gyflawni eu potensial. Heno, hoffwn ni gyflwyno'r pwynt yma. Os yw Cymru yn adeiladu holl system addysg, polisiau a deffau gyda dull gweithredu yn seiliedig ar hawliau plant, bydd hi'n elwa o fframwaith cynhwysfawr sy'n gydlynus, wedi groesawu yn rhyngwladol, yn ole dyddol neutral, ac sy'n cynnig set o werthoedd i blant a thrawon gweithwyr ieiengtyd ar ieni. And when I'm talking about a children's rights approach for education, there are five ways in which I think we can embed those 42 rights of children under the UNCRC. And I'm going to quickly whiz through those five ways that we can embed children's rights in, in our education and other public services, including youth services. So the first one is that the UNCRC, the UN Convention, should be embedded. So at a government level, that means that legislation and policy should be related clearly to children's rights. I'd like to see the new curriculum not only including content about children's rights, but also to show in every area how it can fulfil rights. For example, the new digital um, citizenship curriculum, which I really like, by the way, can be related to children's rights to information, their rights to privacy, safety, to have their say, and to respect the rights of others, for example, by behaving responsibly online. Similarly, the additional learning needs legislation, teacher training reform, and any other new legislation, for example, if we move forward to secure the rights of children who are electively home educated, all of these areas can be linked within a coherent policy framework that places the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child at its core. It gives a common uh, value base to all that we're trying to achieve in Wales. At a school level, we've already seen many schools adopt the UNCRC, and what those schools find 
find is that um, it helps them link and give added meaning to all of their activities, their anti-bullying policies, their eco-councils, their school counselling service, homework clubs, mile-a-day running clubs, um, their peer mentoring schemes, anti-racism, their um, LGBT support groups. There are some of the many ways that schools every day are embedding and um, implementing children's rights. And what these schools find is that if they explicitly link them to children's rights, they have that link to all of those activities. The second important part of implementing a children's rights approach is equality and non-discrimination. That's, of course, an important principle of all human rights um, legislation and principles. So organisations, whether they're Welsh Government, a local authority youth service or schools, can take steps to ensure that specific groups of children don't miss out. So this means, of course, collecting good quality data, quantitative and qualitative, on who is excluded, why, and what works best to give them an equal chance to fulfill their potential. The third method of a children's rights approach is empowering children. Children can't take up their rights unless they're giving the training and the opportunity to do so. We do need universal good quality education on children's rights. Some schools already do this in a really systematic way, and I've seen some fantastic examples of that. But I do still meet sixth formers who say to me that they wish they'd had more than one lesson on the UNCRC and had really understood how it relates to their everyday lives. So children need skills training and information to take part in a school council in a meaningful way, to be pupil governors, to be members of their local authority youth council or trustees of a charity. I run a series of ambassador schemes from my office and if your school isn't a member, please do join. There's information in your packs. And they give children in primary and secondary schools and in community groups the tools to inform other people about children's rights and to inform me about what matters most to them. This is a picture of my strategic advisory panel of young people. And every meeting, we always do some skills training as well so that they can f properly fulfill their role in giving me strategic advice. The fourth method is participation. And it's closely related to empowerment, of course. But it's about giving children opportunities to contribute at all levels. So they might be giving immediate feedback on a lesson or contributing to their individual learning plans or they might be taking part on a more strategic level by being members of panels or boards, or indeed the Youth Parliament that's um, coming our way in Wales, I'm pleased to say. We will get, of course, better solutions if we include everyone affected by them. So the most sustainable discipline, school uniform and anti-bullying policies, for example, will have included the whole school community in agreeing their shared goals and methods. There's one school in Swansea, for example, a secondary school, that redesigned their fixed exclusion policy with their students, uh, staff and students working together on this, and they used a shared language of children's rights to do that. And they slashed their fixed exclusion rate from 33 days in one time period down to one, one day um, over the next uh, time period because everyone accepted um, the disciplinary policy. Finally, schools, um, all public services and governments need to be accountable to children. That means making accessible statements about what you're trying to achieve, your ambitions for children and how you're going to go about them. It means being accountable about spending on children. How is your budget being used to fulfil those goals you have for children? How much of the national and local budgets are being spent on children? It's very hard to work it out, by the way. Accountability is also important to, sh to tell children about what you think you've achieved and what you haven't achieved as well. It's about giving a fair account of what we think we'd, we've done. And none of us fully achieve all of our ambitions. So... I strongly believe that if schools take on a children's rights approach, they'll be strongly placed to take on other key issues facing children and young people in their schools, in their communities, in their youth centres. So um, two key things I'm going to finish on is talking about bullying and mental health problems because they are things that children have told me are extremely important to them that they want me to highlight and teachers and parents have also said, um, particularly in relation to mental health, it's something they want me to, to work on. I think that bull take bullying first, it needs to be seen within a wider lens of healthy relationships education. So it's of course about children's right to be safe and to feel safe. 
in school, at home, and in their communities, and learning to respect the rights of others. So it's their own rights to be safe and learning to respect other people's rights. If you work in a secondary school, please look at this guide that we published recently called Agenda. Um, we published it recently with others, and there's going to be one for primary schools coming very soon. I strongly believe that if we enable children from nursery onwards to learn and practice good interpersonal skills, of course, they are skills like listening, expressing your feelings, empathy, conflict resolution, negotiation, then we'll go a long way to tackling some of the issues that children say they want to be tackled. Um, and those are issues of bullying, sex and relationships, education, well-being. All of those need the same kind of skills um, that you can learn um, throughout your school time. And there are also skills, of course, that employers are looking for, um, the, the kind of soft, what we, we call soft skills that employers are looking for too. Lastly, um, well-being and emotional and mental health. Sometimes, um, in Wales, but not just in Wales, I have to say, we talk as if CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, and the NHS was a front line for children and young people's mental health. But actually, of course, schools are that front line. Schools are where we see and experience children often having difficulties with mental health issues, struggling with their well-being. And of course, therefore, schools are fantastic sites for pre 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 preventing mental ill health, for promoting well-being, and for providing early interventions for children who are facing mental health problems. That doesn't mean that teachers have to do all of that, by the way, of course. Youth workers, health staff, the voluntary sector have all got a role in providing mental health and well-being services but where and when children need that and that often will be on a school site or near to a school site or in the community. I'd actually like to see local mental health coalitions which get everyone around the table in a local area all those experts, whether they're teachers, children themselves, um, mental health uh, NHS experts, and together to plan how to meet children and people's emotional well and mental health needs at a local level. That would fit, of course, with how we should approach things through the Future Generations Act, which we're going to hear about in a bit. And of course, our children's well-being will be best promoted by staff whose well-being is also protected. So I'm a strong advocate of enhancing teachers and other workers' mental health too and making sure that you feel strong. If we recognise that mental health and healthy relationships are children's rights issues and signal our commitment to working with children and young people to develop solutions, we will develop stronger ways of delivering on those issues that work for children and young people. So please look out for my guide to children's rights approach to education, which we're publishing next week on the 18th of May. And that will give lots of examples of how schools in Wales have, ga have gained from embracing a children's rights approach. So we're launching that next week on the 18th. And I look forward to answering some of your questions a bit later. Diolch yn Vara Miranda. Diolch yn fawr iawn, Sally Holland Nessa, gai uh, ofyn i'r Comisiynydd Pobl Hun. Sarah Rochera, will you take to the stage to give us your views? I always feel very short when I stand. Thanks, there we are. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here this evening. Uh, I feel I should just begin by clarifying how old you have to be to be an older person because I'm asked this all the time. Uh, the reality is, well, there are two definitions here in Wales. Uh, the, uh, for my work as the Old People's Commissioner, as an independent champion for our older people, it's 60. So before you get to 60, I'm afraid you're on your own, but once you get to 60, I have a range of legal duties to safeguard your interests. But generally in Wales, we define an older person as being over the age of 50. So a quick show of hands, hands up if you are over the age of 50. Well, congratulations. You might not, on a bad day, think is all that great growing older, but when you think about it, growing older is, of course, the ultimate aspiration, because the alternative is a salutary one. We are too sniffy in this country about growing older. It is something we should celebrate. We should celebrate it at a personal level, but we should also celebrate the fact that we are a nation of older people, because we are currently 750,000 in number, soon we will be one million, we are legion. 
We are everywhere you look. And of course we are, because there are other words you can use alongside the phrase older people. It's a useful shorthand, but it doesn't really do justice to who I represent. Phrases such as mum and dad, for example, you all intimately know older people across Wales. Phrases such as mentor, teacher, and so many other phrases that are resonant with value. Let us not be sniffy about growing older in this country. Let us value our older generations. Worth one billion to the Welsh economy, net of health and social care costs. The question we could be and should be asking ourselves if we were canny is how can we invest further in our older generations and make that return on investment not one billion, but two billion? We all know we live in austere economic times. We might not have much cash, but we have a generation worth one billion, and I know which I'd pick any day. So, having just clarified for those of you that you are older people, you can go home and celebrate that, on to education. So, I know that education is an issue of hot debate in Wales. My plea as the Older People's Commissioner is that these debates and discussions include older people. And that education, and more specifically, opportunities to learn new skills and to stay learning, run through the life course to the very end of our lives. I hold the view that if we want to be a nation that achieves its ambitions, and our ambitions in Wales are strong and right, ambitions of being prosperous, healthy, happy and fair, we need to make sure that older people aren't excluded from our learning and skills programmes. And more than that, we need to give them parity with other groups. Now, you might think, well, she would say that, wouldn't she? She's the Older People's Commissioner for Wales. It's her job to fight their corner. So let me give you three reasons why we could and should make that a reality in Wales. So first of all, at a strategic level, well, at a strategic level, we already, in no small part, recognise this. We have, of course, the Older People's Strategy in Wales now in its third iteration, the first of its kind in the world. We have also the Declaration of the Rights of Older People, groundbreaking rights-based approach, published by Welsh Government, but written, and not amended, I think, almost in a word by Welsh Government, written by older people themselves. And both of those documents recognise the rights that older people should have to continue learning, developing, and through learning uh, and developing their skills, growing. And we also, of course, have in the Social Services and Wellbeing Act the embedment of the UN principles for older people. And one particular one is, of course, relevant to our debate this evening, a right for older people to access appropriate education and training programmes. Good strategic intent. Now, some of you who know me will know that I like my quotes, and I like some really weird, obscure quotes, I have to confess. And one of my favourite quotes is by Mary Poppins. I have two children, it was their favourite film. And there's a quote from that, well begun is half done. And that is a good beginning to recognise the importance of older people continuing to learn as they grow older at that strategic level. But of course, it is only a beginning. What Wales needs to do and government needs to lead is making that intent real for people on a daily basis. Now, the second reason why I hope you will be convinced by my uh, argument this evening that older people need to be fully included and that education and learning needs to run through the life course is that our economy, and we talk a lot about our economy, needs older people, desperately needs our older generations. It needs our older generations to stay in work and to get back to work. And of course, older people will want and need for a variety of reasons as well to stay in work. Now, all the evidence is very clear. We already have, but increasingly we'll have growing skills gaps across our economy. This isn't just an issue for Wales, it's an issue across the United Kingdom. And I don't like to use the phrase Brexit, but who knows what it will look uh, in two, three years' time in terms of our skills gap. Well, who can fill the skills gap that we have? Well, in no small part, older people can fill the skills gap. The reality is that we have over 200,000 older people over the age of 50 who aren't working and are struggling in many, many ways, despite a wealth of experience and knowledge to regain work. Knowledge and experience built up over years 
built up through what they've got right, but built up also through the mistakes they've made, the things that they've learned personally over the years. Now, the reality is, if you lose your job over the age of 50 and you don't get another job within six months, it's not a huge amount of time to find another job, you're more likely to die than ever find another job, despite the skills gap that we have. And I'll tell you what the skills gap looks like in practice. I was talking to a head of adult services, and uh, she said to me, I cannot get carers for love nor money. She said, they just don't exist. I thought, you need carers, and I know a group of people who have got the most amazing competencies and skills and desperately want to work, yet they weren't able to find each other. And the reality, of course, is that for people who fall out of employment too early, the impact on them, their families and their communities, as well as the wider economy, is hugely significant. Now, people don't just need to. Many people will want to stay in work as well. And the benefits of staying in work on people's health and well-being, both physical and emotional and mental health, are, of course, very significant. But there are a wide range of reasons why people struggle to stay in employment. And as is often the case, there are complex, interrelated issues. Many people are carers, for example, and they find it just too difficult to struggle on with too many responsibilities, having to be pulled in too many different directions. There are too many inflexible working practices within our employment sector. And in fact, if you research employment and older people, you will find almost endemic age discrimination running through the sector. Usually not direct, because of course that's not legal. Indirect, but insidious and destructive just the same. But one of the big challenges that older people face is keeping up their skills within the employment workforce. In a world where skills change very, very rapidly. I mean, I struggle to keep up with the skills that I need to stay engaged and relevant. I'm lucky I have two teenagers. I still have the default to them. But it's absolutely crucial that older people have these opportunities to continually develop their skills so they can stay in the workforce where they want to be and where our economy and our public services desperately need them to be. It's why all age apprentices, apprenticeships matter. And I was really pleased that Welsh Government introduced this year those all age apprenticeships. And I look forward in 12, 18 months time to seeing just how many older people have been able to access those opportunities. It's why we so desperately needed a learning and skills strategy for older people. And it's why I was disappointed that the last government didn't deliver on that strategy. It's why we need to design education programmes for older people that meet their needs. And it's why we need to actively target potential older learners. Our economy needs our older workforce to stay there, and older people want to stay there as well. You know, I have to say the reality is, um, who knows when the retirement age will be by the time many of us reach retirement age. This is an issue that is just going to grow and grow and grow. And we need to be really careful that we don't face a situation in years to come where we have older people who have simply fallen through the net and become neets of later age. But if the economic rationale isn't sufficient, then how about a personal reason for why opportunities to learn new skills should be woven through the life course? Something that is perhaps much more personal to you and I. Well, frailty, infirmity, dependence and vulnerability shouldn't be seen as an inevitable part of ageing, because it need not be. But the reality is that for too many people, they find themselves in the most difficult of circumstances as they grow older. The one in six older people in Wales who live in poverty, let's not forget, people die in their own homes every year in Wales because of poverty. The 42% of older people over the age of 50 who are digitally excluded. The one in four of us who will end our lives with some form of dementia. The 50,000 older people who have serious falls every year. These are falls which lead to death, which lead to never going home, lead to people going into care homes, hugely devastating to individuals and hugely costly to the public purse. The endemic numbers of older people who suffer from loneliness and isolation, and in no small part because of that, have become vulnerable victims of crime. 
for all of those people and for all of us as we grow older. The opportunities to learn new skills, to stay engaged in learning, particularly lifelong learning, will be key to ensuring that we have a good older age. You know, being able to stay engaged in learning is a powerful medicine. It keeps you healthy, it keeps you strong, it keeps you resilient. It's also, of course, good for the public purse. Now, how can I be so sure? Well, the five ways to well-being, the mantra for growing older well, one of them is keep learning. Uh, also work from the Learning and Work Institute, huge amount of research that shows participation in adult education increases well-being, equivalent to an increase in annual household income of up to £5,000 a year. And research from people like the National Housing Federation that shows that people are digitally excluded have to pay almost £600 a year more in relation to basic bills. And if you need further convincing, go and visit somebody like the University of the Third Age, and you will see people whose health and well-being is being sustained simply through that opportunity to learn. But what do we need? Well, very quickly, because I see the red flag is going up at the back. It's like, why am I going to be pushed off in a moment? What do we need? Well, we need to recognise how damaging the cuts to things like adult education are. We need to see them as a crucial investment, an investment in the health of our nation. We need to develop offerings that people want and need. I've long held the view that we need to develop the equivalent of the PSE curriculum for grown-ups. Now, I love the PSE curriculum. I have two teenagers. It compensates for my parenting enormously. I'm hugely fond of it. It helps people make the transition, doesn't it, from youth into adulthood. Who helps you make the transition from adulthood into older age? Who tells you the things that you wish you'd known before you got there? Nobody does. We need a PSE curriculum for grown-ups or its equivalent. And we need to give a status to things such as the adult community learning partnerships and intrinsically embed them alongside our wellbeing agendas. Now, I know we have a strong focus in Wales on our younger generations. It's right and proper. I have two myself. But when we invest in older people, we invest in our younger generations as well. There is a mutuality of benefit. Older people in the workplace as mentors, coaches, older people as youth workers and carers, that wealth of experience that they bring and pass on through the generations. Older people who volunteer, older people who are active participants, not just recipients of our learning programmes, and in particular our intergenerational programmes. And Sally and I have a strong focus on intergenerational issues because many of the issues we talk about are the same issues. And older people as well, who sometimes just spend time listening. But of course, listening is a hugely validating thing for somebody to offer you when you are a young person. So to close, I hope I have shown you, persuaded you in just over 10 minutes, why the future well-being of our country is in no small part directly linked to the extent to which we invest in our older generations, that social capital that we have, who could be so much more, who could be worth two billion to our economy. Just as it is important to invest in our younger generations, it must not in Wales be either or. Ours is an agenda in Wales of inclusion. Together, we are stronger as a country. You know, you are never too old to learn, and what you learn as you grow older what you have the opportunity to learn those hard skills, but also those softer skills for life. What you learn will in no small part determine the quality of life you have in later life. Whether you have a good old age or an older age that is too hard sometimes to bear will in no small part depend on those opportunities. And of course, when we get it right for our older generations, we get it right for our younger generations and our children. Because just as our ultimate aspiration should be to grow older, so of course our aspiration for them is that one day they will be older too. Jochen Bauer. Jochen Bauer is a Rakirana. Ac i gloi'n cyflwy ni adeni gai rhoi sawi Comisioner Cenedlaethau'r Dyfodol, The Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie Howe.
Thank you, uh, Dielkan Vauran, Noswetha Paub. Um, it's great to be following such an inspirational group of um, commissioners. It's not quite the first time we have shared a platform together. We work together very regularly, um, often on uh, with joint pieces of work. You will um, learn from what we've all been saying this evening that actually our agendas overlap quite considerably. Um, but the last time we shared a platform together, we were trying to come up what, with what the word for a, um, a group of commissioners might be. A gaggle of commissioners was suggested. Um, I'm guessing that some of those public bodies that we are responsible for constructively challenging might suggest a coven of commissioners. Um, any of you um, English teachers in the the audience any um, any any words to describe this group of commissioners is is uh, is very is very welcomed um, but I'm the commissioner responsible for ensuring public bodies here in Wales are living the principles of the well-being of future generations act now the act is a groundbreaking and game changing a changing piece of legislation that came into force in April last year and in simple terms the legislation requires all of our public bodies in Wales, so uh, 44 of our main public bodies, including the government, all of our local authorities, um, our health boards, and so on, to take decisions in a way that meet today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And it requires us to also think about the connections between our social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being. So that's critically important in terms of recognising decisions we take in one area have an impact on other areas. And actually, when you're thinking about our country or whether you're thinking about individuals, um, we need to be thinking about things holistically. And enshrined within the legislation is my role, that of the Future Generations Commissioner, and the, um, the Act describes me as the guardian of future generations. And that sounds something like um, it's from the Avengers or something, don't it? And it doesn't it? And it be, can be quite sort of uh, challenging and feel quite daunting when you consider that future generations can mean all things to all people. And my role spans all policy areas, um, all, uh, all parts of the population of Wales and everyone who isn't born yet. So, um, you know, no pressure there then. Um, but in fact, the role of every commissioner here um, contributes to the aspirations um, of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But as well as my role in holding to account, my role is to advise and support um, thinking out there in the public sector about the long term to encourage innovation and risk-taking. That's uh, not always something that we're comfortable with um, within the public sector. And my last job was in the police service. Might have been quite helpful in the enforcement side of things, but also one of my favorite phrases that I took um, from that role is about the need for us all to take responsibility for driving change, for us all to be willing to challenge the status quo and do things differently, and to drive that change, we need to be determined um, and willing to proceed until apprehended or, of course, tasered. And I think that there's something that um, all of us in this room certainly have in common, is that we're looking to secure the best possible chances in life for our future generations. And for you, that probably means the way in which you um, inspire, you educate, you equip young people to be, as Sally says, the best that they can be. For me, it's about how we can do that with young people now, um, as well as equipping those who take the, uh, decisions on their behalf to do it um, with them and those coming behind them in mind, and how we can ensure that we do that in a way uh, where we still have a planet, uh, for example, that still actually exists in the future. So that's the interconnections, um, social, economic, environmental and cultural, because these things are clearly interlinked. And the people that you teach today will be the public sector leaders of the future, the startup entrepreneurs, the consumers, and of course the global citizens of the future. And I think in the short term, over the coming months and years, you will be dealing with national tests and curriculum reform, and with Kirsty and her team, um, you will be wanting to shape those things. But in shaping those things, we must have an eye to what the future might hold, because you will be significant players in how to respond, it, uh, respond to that future and actually what sort of future we create. So the question of how well we are equipping our children and young people for the future really is a crucial one. How are we bridging the gaps uh, between the skills that employers in Wales need and the paths that your pupils 
um, will want to take. How are we looking beyond measurements of success, whether, as to be uh, being whether a pupil leaves school with five GCSEs, to whether they can successfully find secure local employment without having to travel miles and without being stuck on zero-hour contracts? Or actually, are those things um, inevitable in terms of becoming the norm of the future and therefore if they are how do we prepare our young people to adapt and thrive nonetheless nonetheless how are we inspiring our most talented graduates to stay in Wales in the short to medium term over the next few years we have a stockpile of large infrastructure programs such as the metro the city deals um, alongside a vast amount of low paid and low skilled workers and so what role do we all have in connecting those two things. But then what about the long term? What do we really mean when we talk about the future of education in Wales? And it's tempting to look at forecasts from tech giants and think tanks and assume we need to be preparing children and young people, uh, people for a future that looks something like Blade Runner. Um, and of course the future is really impossible to predict, but there are clues out there um, if we choose to look for them. So I guess 30 years ago, it was a big deal when schools got their first computers. Today, it's a big deal when students get their own laptops. According to a 2016 report by the World Economic Forum, 65% of the children who are now starting school will find themselves working in jobs as adults that don't even exist yet. And according to McKinsey, technology could automate 45% of the tasks that people are currently paid to do. What will that mean in terms of how we need to be thinking and planning um, for the future of our children and young people? Futurologist Thomas Frey predicts a future in which the largest company on the internet in 2030 will be an education-based company that we haven't even heard of yet. A company that will be focused on educating young people, adapting and adjusting to different learning styles, um, and accordingly allowing pupils, he claims, uh, to, move, uh, to learn much faster. And according to him, that could be um, breezing through material at between four to ten times the speed that they do currently, and perhaps completing an undergraduate course in less than half a year. So these are some of the things that our futurologists, our futures think thinkers, are starting to think about now. And I guess when you're talking about the future, it's always difficult uh, to conceptualise that. It's always difficult to understand it. But if we think just 10 years ago, um, when the first iPhone um, you know, first came into existence, and the way that that technology has, has developed, um, and how we use iPhones now, how they're practically surgically connected um, to our hands. If they're not yours, they certainly are um, of our younger generations. And that's just in a period um, of one decade. So before everyone panics about robot teachers in the classroom, I do think it's worth thinking um, about the roles that robots cannot replace. So despite their uh, ability to imbibe knowledge, these pieces of software cannot, of course, replace human and pastoral support. And it's also clear from research that building emotional literacy will be just as crucial for future generations as technical literacy. And ironically, of course, emotional literacy and resilience are skills that have been traditionally, and in my opinion, wrongly branded as soft, as, as soft skills. And the traditional approach to teaching and monitoring the success of the, the three R's um, and the undue emphasis on hard skills, I think, has meant that previous educational systems have simply not kept pace with the change in nature of the workforce and need for 21st century skills. So students um, perhaps have been missing out on emotional literacy, creativity and empathy. And Professor of Education Theresa Kremen in the UK's Open University described this approach as educating for the past, not the rapidly changing and unknown future. According to teachers at Connections Academy, educators need to focus on three core 21st century skills, complex problem solving, critical thinking, and collaboration. And in a world that is becoming more digitally connected, now more than ever, we need to ensure that our students are emotionally resilient. So as a workforce, are we thinking about how we need to recruit teachers um, with the right skills to be teaching our children these skills of the future? Skills which will be as much about being able to facilitate learning, the ability to inspire curiosity, to model and teach emotional intelligence, as much as they are about being a top grade STEM subject student yourself. And famous um, Ivy League University, MIT in Boston, 
who are one of the world's leading institutions producing for producing the world's elite um, technologists, run a programme which is slightly tongue-in-cheek, um, but not really, called a charm school, which includes everything from how to make eye contact to how to break bad news. So we need to think about whether the skills of our workforce are, ma are matched to these softer skills um, requirements. And it reminds me again of an example um, of these same challenges that uh, very many of our workforces are, are facing. We face the same challenge um, within the police. Gone are the days when policing was about blue lights and pub fights. Um, and actually, when 80% of demand um, for policing these days is around vulnerability, why then are we still recruiting officers who are good at bundling people into vans and breaking down doors but cannot empathise and engage with a victim of domestic abuse? These are the skills, the softer skills, that we will need to be building in to how we recruit um, people in, in the future. And of course, the age-old question of how we value our teachers. In Finland, for example, there is this, there has always been really this value on education and on educators, so much so that only 11% of applicants get a place on teaching degrees in university in Finland. Um, maybe there are some parallels there with why they consistently um, top those world rankings. I think we need to have a conversation about how we recruit the skills amongst teachers that will facilitate the type of learning we want in pupils, and particularly where we focus on the resilience of young people, we must be looking beyond traditional educational models. So preparing a young person for the future doesn't just mean equipping them with a certain set of qualifications, it means equipping them with the skills to be the very best versions of themselves and recognising the external factors in a person's life that may prohibit that. And that means that schools, youth workers and educators have a significant role to play in reducing adverse and identifying adverse childhood experiences in schools. So if you haven't heard about adverse childhood experiences or as them defined in that way, you will certainly recognise them within your classroom. So adverse childhood experiences defined um, as growing up in a household where there's domestic abuse, substance misuse, mental health problems, parental separation or incarceration. And 14% of the Welsh population have grown up um, in households where they have experienced four or more of those adverse childhood experiences. And for those young people growing up in households where there are four or more ACEs significantly negatively impacts on their life chances. For, so those young people with four or more ACEs, 20 times more likely to end up in prison, six times more likely to have a teenage pregnancy, 15 times more likely to be using um, crack cocaine. In other words, sig significantly more likely to be adopting the health-harming behaviours um, which is going to impede their success um, into adulthood. And I guess as I talk about ACEs, undoubtedly previous pupils or perhaps current pupils will be springing to mind. You will recognise these children in your classrooms now. You perhaps might see uh, the children that you have taught um, and the positions that they are now in um, in adulthood. And there's been some fantastic work that Public Health Wales have done and extensive research in this area um, which will have multiple implications for your work. There's a great example from Washington in America where one third of a class had four or more ACEs um, and these ACEs were seen as a better predictor of health, attendance and behaviours within the school. In fact, educational success was found to be more related to ACEs than to family income. And following intervention and teaching from public health on how to spot ACEs and to take a different kind of action on them, they had an 83% drop in suspension rates and 75% decrease in fighting in school. So we need to be thinking about how our strategies at a national level, but also strategies in the classroom, are taking account of the experiences that are going on elsewhere in these young people's lives. And for many young people, as you will undoubtedly know, you may be the only safe adult in their lives. And while school um, is somewhere where on a bad day, um, my kids want to avoid, for some, for very many, it's a place of sanctuary. And for our most difficult and challenging pupils, it's often the case that those who need the most love will show it in the most unloving of ways. And so whilst we embrace an ever more technical world, it's important that education doesn't lose sight of that human touch. There are some things that the internet and augmented reality will never be able to teach young people. And looking at the world in 2017, empathy with others is perhaps the skill that's most needed right now. 
So thank you very much for listening to me this evening. I look forward to taking questions from you later, but I would like to finish with a quote from America educational reformer, John Dewey. Um, if we teach today as we taught yesterday, we will rob our children of tomorrow. Thank you. Diolch yn fawr iawn i'r comisiynwyr fyna am eu cyflwyniadau. Um, Digon i gnoi cil arno fe yn fyna. Um, I am conscious. We're going to move now on to um, this part of the evening. We will take questions from yourselves in the audience. I'm conscious that a few of you might have to uh, be more dependent on, uh, on hearing than sight in the corner here, but I hope as one, as one sense lacks, another one improves. But there are a few free um, chairs here if you do want to move along. So um, just to go straight ahead into the questions this evening, um, I believe the first question comes from John uh, Lykman. Am I right? Can John... Oh, can we get a mic over to John in the corner over there? Hello. Oh. Yeah, it's working now. <laughs> okay, I'm John Lightman. I'm from a, a well-being company called Gwilan. And uh, I've really enjoyed hearing what everybody on the panel has had to say this evening, uh, particularly on matters of, of well-being. My question is this. Uh, a recent program for the International Student Assessment Study ranked the UK 38 out of 48 countries for teenage well-being. Uh, are the panel satisfied with the findings? And if they are not, what will be your individual and collaborative roles in raising levels of well-being in Wales? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I'll start with uh, Sally Holland, if, uh, if your mic's working. I think I might have. Oh, I oh. haven't broken it. I, had, I thought I had a terrible confession to make then. <laughs> I've lost the clip. I'm really sorry, whoever's in charge of the microphones, but it's working. That's the main we'll thing. Navigate that. But um, yeah. well-being of, yeah. of the young people is your raison d'etre. How do you respond to the findings of the Programme for International Student Assessment? Yeah, so that was the, the, the well-being part of the, the PISA work that we saw. So there's a lot of attention given to the, the headline PISA results, but there's some other really interesting results that follow that and um, obviously I've looked at the well-being aspects um, very closely. It doesn't give completely clear answers on why some countries rank higher than others. Um, it's not just related to the amount of testing, academic success or child poverty. They're all things that, you know, could be your hypotheses really as to why, or even inequalities. But, but the study does give us some clues as to some reasons why children may feel more safe and happy in terms of well-being than others. Um, it talks certainly children who expressed more confidence in their relationships with their parents and with their teachers seem to feel happier in school. Um, we know um, that when children are raised in homes with parents who are authoritative, so not authoritarian, or laissez fair, you know, whatever you want, dear, kind of thing, but authoritative. <laughs> So they um, have clear rules and boundaries, but they also listen well. Then children do better academically and well-being. And I think the same, my hypothesis is the same applies in schools. So teachers who are clear, you know, have good boundaries, but actually are good, children feel valued by them and listened Can to ask, them as well. You've, you've um, been involved, you've um, surveyed the biggest survey, I think, that's been yes. done on young people since you've come to the role. Does it resonate with your findings? And what do those findings tell you about the reasons, if it does resonate with your findings? Yes, yeah, so I did a survey, uh, Beth Nessa, what next, um, in the, my first year and um, post, uh, 7,000 children in Wales took part in that age from three up to 18, and a lot of um, parents and, and other adults, interested adults, took part as well. And um, yeah, there was, the patterns there were very similar, as we might expect, and very similar to the rest of the UK. And we don't know from here how Wales sits from this mm. piece of survey. Um, but uh, children from poorer backgrounds on the whole, um, or certainly living in poorer areas, um, it said they had lower well-being, were more likely to be bullied, and less likely to feel safe in school and in their community. So that gave some clues, really, about poverty, the role of child poverty and inequality and how we, how we need to move forward. Is it fair that. to say it's an issue, and we'll just to nail it down, is it fair to say that well-being, the issue of well-being amongst young people is an issue in Wales, and 
reflected in the concerns raised by PISA? It absolutely is. Um, children say this to me, parents say this to me, and, and teachers say this to me, that they're concerned about the well-being um, of the children in their schools. Um, some people say that children are more pressure now than they were, um, more testing, uh, more academic pressure. It used to be okay to sort of bumble through school and get sort of a range of B's and C's, but now the real pressure to get certain grades, etc. And obviously we've got the whole pressure of living your life through social media and pressure on appearance and, um, and your public portrayal of yourself, which some children, very resilient children are very good at working with in a creative way and resisting. Um, and some children find difficult to cope with. We all need to find new ways of living with our new realities. Sophie talked about how life's changed in the last decade. And um, some children do that very well, some find it a real pressure. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we could go on, especially with the research you've done, but Sophie, um, you mentioned that you know, Future Generations Commission and wellbeing is a, is a big part of that. How do you respond to the findings of the, the um, PISA research? Okay, I think that the, um, you know, the, the Wellbeing Future Generations Act is um, a significant player in terms of how the wellbeing agenda goes forward. Um, note the title is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, not the Needs of Future Generations Act. And that is a subtle but really important distinction because I think our past public policy making approach is to be focused solely, really, on needs. Um, needs, if you look at the Oxford English definition, is defined as uh, um, of necessity. Um, well-being defined as a state of being happy, healthy and comfortable. And when you look across a whole range of policy areas, whether, um, you know, I'm sure you know, Sarah will have, um, I know does have particular views on this, um, the needs of an elder, uh, an older person might be being met in terms of a care package that they might have. Is their well-being um, being considered and being addressed? No, and I think we see similar patterns um, within, uh, within schools and within um, particular um, services for young people. As I talked about the, you know, where the future is going and what sorts of skills we will need to be focusing on in the future, I think that concept of well-being, happy, healthy, comfortable, is going to come even more into play and probably closer to a need that we need to address if we're going to move forward as a country. Because if we're not able to equip um, our children to be emotionally resilient, um, if we're not um, designing policies that are going to focus on um, on their well-being, um, we are not going to be creating young people who are going to meet the needs of our future, of our economy um, and of our public services in the future. So, I guess in terms of back to the question, which is, you know, what is my contribution? Um, my contribution is making sure that the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is implemented, that there's a shift in understanding and actual um, of well-being versus needs and action in those areas. And I guess my plea to government, the Act provides a good um, starting point for it, but my plea to government is to really think about how things are measured. You know, it said what gets measured gets done, and so we really need to be thinking about where targets, performance indicators, things we are measuring are um, ticking the box but missing the point and how we need to shift those measures to a more holistic focus on wellbeing. You mentioned emotional resilience. Sorry, I'm aware my mic's a little louder. I'll, I won't shout as much. Um, you mentioned emotional resilience um, in your presentation as well. How do you see that being uh, manifested in the schools? You, do, you, do you mean particular lessons, things that focus specifically on emotional literacy, that kind of thing? Is that, is that how you envision that emo emotional resilience literacy? I think it could be part of that, but when you think about the, um, you know, the ACE agenda, we're not even really um, identifying those children, young people who are encountering those things at home. So um, there will be pupils in your classrooms um, today who will have um, witnessed mum or dad being beaten up last night. The police will have been called. They will arrive in your classroom this morning and you will have no idea um, that any of that has happened and won't necessarily therefore be able to take any action on that. So I think it's about having better in integration and understanding across our public services. It's about um, building in performance measures and targets which give um, uh, teachers and educators enough time to be focusing on that kind of emotional uh, literacy and that understanding of a child's well-being holistically, um, as well as perhaps um, adapting as MIT have done in terms of some of those kind of uh, focus things where um, you know emotional literacy may need an added boost considering a lot of our kids are spending times with their um, their heads in their phone rather than their heads up having 
uh, conversation and discourse. Okay, thank you. Sarah, interesting to have your uh, perspective on this, I suppose. Um, how do you respond to um, the issue of well-being amongst young people and what's your take on it? Well, you might think I perhaps don't as the Older People's Commissioner since I represent people over the age of 60. Uh, however, I do at two levels. One is as a mother. Of course, I have huge concerns around this. I have teenagers and I want them to grow up to be happy individuals who have fulfilled lives and who feel good in themselves and content about themselves. So at a personal level, I do, as do all of us in different ways at a personal level. But I think if you were asking older people, and if part of my role is to give a voice to older people, <coughs> would they be concerned? Absolutely they would, because older people, of course, have a huge care across generations, because they don't call younger generations younger generations, they call them their grandchildren, they call them by their names. As I mentioned earlier, we're intimately connected across those generations. One of the things, um, um, like um, Sally, I'm a rights-based uh, commissioner. I think rights matter enormously. I actually think young people should have a right to have time with older people and older people should have a right to spend time with younger people as well. That quality time. And one of the things that we often talk about in my office is how over the years generations have been pushed apart. And you know, there used to be a time when your grandparents were near to you, when everyone would have an auntie who lived down the street. There's people you could spend time with, people you could talk with, people you could offload with. People were in a different relation to you than the relationship you might have uh, with your parents. So I think older people as a generation would be hugely concerned and would want it to be different. Now, I can say that because I only have five priorities as commissioner and the first of those is all about well-being. Because I think older people absolutely get, when you strip everything else back, it is about our well-being. And it's one of the reasons I was so supportive of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act when it came in, because it is the ultimate outcome. It is all about well-being. And actually, the fact that Wales recognises that is hugely, hugely important. Everything we do in public service, everything government does at national and local level, it's all driven back to those outcomes. It's about quality of life and it's about well-being. Okay, thanks a lot. An element of that question asked about um, your collaborative roles. Um, Mary, how much collaboration is there? Faint o gydweithio sydd rhyngoch chi fel comisiynwyr yn wedig o safle bwynt a ddysg, gawn ni? O'n i'n gwybod yn gydweud yn bod ni yn adnabod cryfderau a chyfleoedd yn gilydd ac wedyn adnabod lle allwn ni gydweithio. Mae Sally a Sarah yn sôn ymwaith maen nhw wedi wneud yr y cyd ynglyn a gweithio a draws cynadlaethau yn yr un ffordd Mae Sally a fyna yn gweithio yn agos iawn o ran anghenion bobl ifanc yng Nghymru a creu picture, a dwi'n gwneud dyna bod sy'n bwysig i bod ni'n creu cyfanrwydd y picture yn hedrych yn y gweld pedair comisiynydd nyn sydd yn eistedd mewn seilos ar wahan i ni gyd yn anelu tuag at yr un nod sef lles yn pobl yn gwlad a ffyniant so felly ma modd gweithio ar y cyd, dwi'n lwcus iawn hefyd wrth gwrs oherwydd ma yna gomisiynwyr iaith mewn gwledydd eraill ac felly dwi'n gallu tynnu ar gryfder y rhai hynny mae yna bump comisiynydd iaith yn gweithredu yng nghanad y, yn cynrychioli gwahanol i eithodd a gwahanol gymunedau yn fyna. Mae yna gomisiynydd iaith yn ei werddon, mae yna gomisiynydd iaith yn Kosovo, a mae'r heriau sy'n gwynebu y person o Kosovo mor wahanol, ond eto ddim mor wahanol i beth i ni'n ceisio wneud, sef creu undod, creu un cyfeiriad ac adnabod cyfleoedd o fod yn wahanol o fod yn Gymru sydd a chyfleoedd arbennig o ran iaith, diwylliant ac economi. Ach chi'n sôn fy ran byd o gweithio mewn seilod. Pa mae'r aml fyddwch chi'n cwrdd a chomisiynwyr eraill? Pa mae'r aml mwyn am digwydd? Rhwch lw syniad i ni? I ni'n cwrdd am ffurfiol pedair gwaith y flwyddyn. Chi'n cwrdd fel pedair comisiynydd pedair gwaith y flwyddyn? I ni'n eisiau rownd fod. Digwydd bod mae Sophie Landstar yn yr un swyddfa a fyna. Um, I ni'n cwrdd anaml iawn, ac wedyn pan ma'r pethau penodol yn codi. Oedd gwrs i ni wedi gwrdd ffôn lan. Um, mae'n achosion yn codi anaml iawn, lle mae achos wedi cael ei um, gyfleu i fyna, ac i Sali yn delio gyda llesiant o ran pobl ifanc. Yn yr un ffordd, mae Sera a fyna wedi edrych ar materion ofal sylfaenol. Uh, eto um, anghenion pobl wrth bod nhw'n ymwneud a meddygon yn ei cymunedau. A mae hwnna wedi bod yn ddarn pwerus y waith, lle ni wedi galled gweithio 
a serum, mae'n rhaid i ddweud i'r cymryd gwaith mlaen ddechreuon ni. So felly, mae'n ma adrofodaeth, falle bydd eich rhywbeth i ni, yr ffaith bod ni'n bedair menyw, mae'n maen nhw wedi yn tueddu siarad a sortio rhywbeth mas. Siwr bod yna wi'r efyn yn ni. Iawn, ewn ni mlaen i'r cwestiwn nesaf. Cwestiwn oddi o'r Catherine James, dwi'n deall, sydd nesa. Hello. Beth yw'r cwestiwn sy'n gyda ni. Diolch yn fawr. Catrin James yw'r Gobaith Cymru. Mae gen i ni'n gyd yng Nghymru yn pobl ifanc a'n sefydliadau trydydd sector, talent a syniadau dewr i lunio genedl Gymreig i fod yn brawd o honni. Ond er hyn, yng Nghymru, ni'n ni'n dweud ein bod ni'n gwneud pethau'n gwahanol. Pa mor wir yw hyn yn eich profiad chi? a beth allwch chi ei gynnig i bobl Cymru? Pa mor wir yw hi bod ni'n ei pethau'n wahanol? How true is it that we do things differently here in Wales? I might start with our newest commissioner, Sophia Howe. How true is it really? You know, we've got this very aspirational talk, you know. How true is it that we're actually acting and, and uh, cutting our own cloth, so to speak? Uh, how, how, how true is it? Well, I think there are some really good examples where we do things differently. The Wellbeing Future Generations Act is um, a really good example of that. Um, it, as I said earlier, it's internationally groundbreaking. There's no other country anywhere in the world that has legislation um, quite like it. However, um, what I absolutely recognise is the challenges as um, inspirational, aspirational um, and groundbreaking as that legislation might be. Um, the, well, when the United Nations uh, came to Wales, when the Act was passed, they said, um, we hope what Wales is doing today, the world will do tomorrow. But there was a second part of the quote, which was, action more than words is the hope for future generations. And that's the nub of it, really. And I think we do still, whilst we have some great policies and strategies in Wales, um, translating those policies and strategies into actual action and change on the ground um, is something where I think we still have some way uh, to go and so you know you hear a lot about the um, implementation gap and perhaps that's something about the way that we do policy making and I think the Future Generations Act provides a real um, framework, a really simple common sense framework for doing that um, policy making and implementation differently so it talks about planning for the long term, it talks about a shift from prevention, critically it talks about collaborating um, with public bodies. So I guess, you know, when government is making um, policy, how well is that policy based on the knowledge, experience and expertise of those who will be um, implementing it? I know that there are great strides to, to do that, but could we do that um, better? How well have we involved people? So people like yourselves, but actually how well have we involved um, the people who are going to be the recipients um, of our policy? How well do we understand the lives that people lead? And that's the involvement principle with, with, within the Act. And then the final area where I think that we need to be um, better and be doing things um, differently or doing things better is around um, integration. So when we're developing our policy, how well do we understand what's going on in other areas and how well um, integrated are those areas? And I think a really good example um, of that is the, um, the, the, the manifesto commitment around the, the childcare offer. Now, we can develop that childcare offer in a way which is a standalone um, design for parents to, uh, you know, to, to, to provide childcare for their, for their kids for their 30 hours a week or, or whatever it might be. Or we could design it in a way which is actually going to address some of these big intergenerational challenges that we're facing. We could design it in a way which has integrated thinking in terms of how it's going to contribute uh, to the one million Welsh speakers. We could design it in a way um, where we're focusing at that very early stage on emotional literacy and well-being. Mm. We could design it in a way which promotes um, intergenerational equity and, um, and involvement. So I guess we do do things differently um, in Wales in some areas, but we face the same challenges as very many other countries in the UK and internationally in terms of turning those big ideas into things that are going to be practically working on the ground. Okay, thanks. Sarah Rokira, um, there's an Older People's Commissioner in Wales, there isn't one in England still, though there's been calls for it. Um, why is that? Why do you think, the, you know, has the idea been a su success in Wales? I'm guessing you'll say yes. Why is that and why maybe you know, that hasn't been replicated across the border? Well, as to whether my role is a success in Wales, I think you'd have to ask older people, that, because ultimately they will be the judge uh, of that. I, 
in a sense, I don't know the answer to why there isn't one uh, in, uh, in England. I am asked from time to time to talk in England about what my role is. I make it very clear. Uh, I, I don't suggest and they should have a post, but I do explain what I do as commissioner and how I think it makes a difference to the lives of older people. I think we have actually a number of differences here in Wales, because I always say I'm not just a commissioner, I'm a Welsh commissioner. It's the Welsh bit that makes a difference, because I think all of us commissioners are drawn from a value base here in Wales. The things that we think and believe in Wales are inherently important. Things such as fairness, social justice, uh, equality, those value-based approaches which I think underpin and join up all of the work that we do. And I think those are very real and tangible when you look at the policy agendas that we have here in Wales. And you don't have, I think, that clarity of cultural identity and cultural identity reflected in that value base outside of Wales. Um, so there are only two commissioners of my kind in the world. Wales was the first, the other is in Northern Ireland. But I think uh, structural issues aside, I think what else we have that is different in Wales is our ambition. I mean, we've been talking about well-being. Uh, it's a hugely significant ambition to have. As I said earlier, when you strip the wisdom of age, when you strip everything else away, the things that you can buy, the, the tangible things, what you are left with is your sense of well-being in, your, in and of yourself, within your family and the community in which you live. So I think there are some really significant and growing differences. And if you just want to see a really practical we'll example... We'll have to be quick on this, I think, because time's, a, time's getting ahead of us. ...of what that looks like outside of ambition and value. If you look at the National Outcomes Framework that sits behind the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, it says in there, this is the job of social services, to support people to say things such as, I belong. Now, that's a really radical outcome-based approach. Okay, thanks. Sally, I'm going to have to ask you to be quick and the same with Mary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My llywodraeth um, aelodau'r cynulliad a cynghorau'n digon hygych. So dwi'n falch iawn. Mae lot o waith i'w wneud, wrth cwrs. Ond, uh, yeah, no, dwi'n falch iawn i gweithio yma. Mantus yn ymaint, neu fel yeah. petai. Yeah. Uh, Mary, o di'n i'n ei digon i'n wneud yn hunain yn wahanol, yn torri cwys yn hunain yma yng Nghymru? Un peth i'n ddim yn gwneud yw um, adnabod yr hyn sydd wedi digwydd yng Nghymru yn ystod y Ddau ddeg eld diwethaf yn credu bod angen i ni ddathlu yr hyn sydd wedi gyllu gyflawni. Ddim gweld hynny fel pen y daeth, ond bod ni'n gallu symud mlaen o fyna. Meddyliwch yma ddys cyfrwng Cymraeg. Yr tŵ sydd wedi bod ar ffigurau yna yn un rhannu englyn a pobl ifanc yn dysgu'r Gymraeg yn yr ysgol. Mae angen i ni ddathlu, dathlu, cydnabod yr hyn sydd um, i ni wedi gyflawni, ond nawr, meddwl, lle ni eisiau mynd am y gymlynedd nesaf. Un i'n gallu llwyddo, a mae'r llwyddiant yn creu llwyddiant. Wel, na fe, ar yn odyn, maen nhw'n ei fod yn torffon i math, na fe, dwi'n meddwl so, welli fi ddod at y cwestiwn ola, a tri deg eiliad yr un, fydd gyda chi ateb hon, maen dod oddi wrth bynnu Tyler. Um, hello, good evening, I'm Bernie Tyler from ISA Training, a work-based learning provider. Um, the Cabinet Secretary is with us this evening. So if you each had 30 seconds to pitch your ideas on how to move education forward in Wales, what would you say? Now, it's always a good idea to take, a, take the opportunity to pitch to the um, Education Secretary. Right, we'll start in the same order we started last one. Sophie Howe, do you want to go first? 30 seconds. Right, task. Okay. So I think the future of education depends on our capacity for innovation, on encouraging new ideas. Um, it, in, it depends on us creating not just tech-savvy um, students, but uh, young people who are confident and skilled communicators and who are emotionally resilient. And therefore, my pitch would be to build on this concept of well-being and understand how that needs to fit within our new curriculum and things that uh, get measured within it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sarah Rukira, how are you going to better that? What's your pitch? Uh, see our older generation as an integral part of our learning and education agenda in Wales. Recognise them for the asset they are and what they have to contribute, not just in relation to hard skills, but in relation to those softer skills. Because by the time you get to older age, there aren't many mistakes you haven't made. 
and there's a huge amount you have to pass on. No, great, concise and within time. Sally Holland. Okay, well I generally support the current direction we're going in, in education, so I want to say that to start, encourage you to hold your nerve, because um, there will be pressures to, to go off course if results change or whatever. So, uh, don't rush change, make sure everyone is ready for it. Look at the performance indicators as Sophie's mentioned, are they, are they, do they represent what we're trying to actually achieve with our children? Please embrace a whole school approach to healthy relationships, healthy bodies and healthy self-esteem for our children and then they'll be ready to learn. And lastly, as I've pitched a lot for 10 minutes today, please adopt a children's rights approach as an overall framework. I think that can be a really good guide um, to achieve the change process that we're all looking for, make it accountable to children and it will involve them meaningfully in that process. Thank you very much. It's like Dragon's Den in here, isn't it? Right, I Canal yr uchelgais, gai canmol chi am yr uchelgais yna, cadw'r nerf yn ael salu'n sôn am, o ran cadw'r nod o greu Cymru gwlad fach ddwyaethog gyda gweithlu sydd yn gallu gweithredu yn ddwyaethog, ac ar y daith yna peidio anghofio o'r pobl yna sydd yn mynd i gyflawni hynny sydd yn pobl sydd yn gwmpas ni fan hyn y gweithlu a ddysg. Fe, great, diolch yn fwyr chi yn fwyr mor grynof yna. And on that note, then I will close uh, the evening there. Thank you very much to you all for turning out this evening. A great turnout and filled a, a very big hall here. Diolch yn fod i chi fel comisiynwyr am ddod i roi dych cyfriniadau ac i gyfrannu at y cwestiynau ni wedi cael wedi. Ni'n llwyth sy'n llwyth yn rhagor i gael, ond diolch am um, atebion y cynwysfarch i fyna. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Hannah Pudner from uh, the Open University and uh, Hayden Llewellyn from the EWC. Hello, good evening everyone. Well that was absolutely fantastic. Really uh, fascinating perspectives and four very um, inspiring women, so thank you very much. We at the Open University, we're absolutely delighted to be sporting the EWC's professionally speaking event for the second time in a row. <coughs> Excuse me. It's particularly relevant uh, for the Open University as we work to support the professional development of thousands of teachers and lecturers support staff, youth workers, and education leaders all across Wales. And we have worked with schools and colleges, trade unions, local authorities, and the Welsh Government to offer flexible professional development across all of the professions in the education sector in Wales. Now, for, in for instance, since the introduction of registration of school support staff, we've been working with Unison to develop a programme for over 700 teaching assistants where we've been holding uh, weekend workshops on behaviour management, closing the attainment gap, and making literacy fun. And this summer, we'll be completing um, a free online course of teaching assistance on our bilingual website, Open Learn Cymru. And this is just a range, uh, a range of highlights on why we're so keen to support the EWC in developing um, the teachers and uh, practitioners for today and for the future. Now, the OU is new in university terms, we're young in university terms. We're turning a mere 50 in 2019, so maybe then we'll be slightly uh, in the older category. But we've achieved a lot, and we're really proud of what we've done with the education workforce over the last 50 years, and we're looking forward to the next 50 years. So I just want to say, on behalf of the Open University in Wales, welcome to, to the speakers, and thank you very much for your coming. Thank you. <laughs> thanks very much Hannah in cl closing tonight's event I've got the easy bit to do and that's simply to say some thanks to a number of people this evening so my first set of thanks is to our excellent speakers this evening and also to Catherine as facilitator and we have a small gift for everybody that Hannah is going to hand out on my behalf Okay, as Hannah is working her way round, I'll keep moving so you can find your way home this evening. My second set of thanks is to the EWC staff. The team here, I'm sure you agree, has put together an excellent evening this evening. So I'd like to thank them in particular, particularly uh, Karen Evans and Matthew Rees. Thank you to them.
And my final set of thanks is to you. Thank you for coming. It's a Monday night, I think the warmest evening of the year, so thank you for taking time out to come and join us this evening. If the event tonight has whetted your appetite, there's two other things that may be of interest to you in the month of May that the EWC is running. Firstly, on the 18th of May, between 1 o'clock and 3 in the Senate, we have a policy briefing on the recruitment, retention and career progression of teaching. Uh, free, events for, free, free tickets from the EWC website if you'd like to join us. And then at the end of the month, we'll be at the Air of Eisteddfod, along with qualifications, Wales and Est in, in a joint area there. So if tonight has whetted your appetite, delighted to see you on those occasions as well. So without further ado, I'll close the event and wish you a safe journey home.